Welcome to Moriel TV for this week in prophecy, January 6th, 2019. My name is Joshua, live with James Jacob Prash. Jacob. Blessings in Jesus, dear friends, as we commence 2019. You know our ministry is based in several countries, including the Middle East. And in this week in prophecy, we look at events usually focused on the Middle East because of their prophetic importance, but presented to people in Western countries. Today, the 6th of January, is Christmas in the Middle East. In the Eastern Church traditions, Christmas is the 6th of January. In the West, in Europe, it's known as the Feast of the Epiphany, and it is associated for religious purposes with the arrival of the Magi to see the baby Jesus in Bethlehem following his birth. You wouldn't know this from the staple scenes where they have in the stables the shepherds and the magi there simultaneously. However, the biblical record would indicate that the magi came later and the traditional day in Europe as it's celebrated is the Epiphany. Then you have the Feast of St. Nicholas in certain countries in Europe, such as Holland, on the 14th of December. Then we have Christmas on the 25th of December, which had been the pagan Roman feast of Saturnalia, but which also may, depending on the juxtaposition of the lunar to solar calendars in any given year, correspond or overlap with, or be congruous with, the 25th of Kislev, the first day of Hanukkah in the Jewish tradition. 25th of Saturnalia, 25th of December, 25th of Kislev. Then the 14th of December, where St. Nicholas becomes convoluted in the English-speaking countries with Father Christmas or Santa Claus. Confused? That's only the beginning. It's more confusing than that. But today in the Middle East, it is Christmas. It is the Christmas of the Middle East today. It is not December 25th in the Middle East. It is today, the 6th of December, celebrated as the Epiphany in Western Europe celebrated as nothing but the day you take your Christmas tree down in North America, the holiday season. Personally, to avoid confusion, I like to stick to the scriptural holy days. Nonetheless, the rabbis changed the Jewish New Year to Rosh Hashanah, changing the Feast of Trumpets in the autumn to being the New Year when the Torah, the Pentateuch teaches, the beginning of the year is the first of the month of Nisan, roughly corresponding to April, two weeks before Passover or Pesach. Now you're really confused. These things happen for all kinds of reasons. I won't even begin with the Islamic calendar based on the flight of Muhammad from Mecca to Medina. Also, a major factor in the way time is counted in the Middle East. Why do I bring this subject up other than the time of year? One of the things we know is that the Antichrist will seek to change the times and the laws. God is the God of history, but we know that for a three and a half year period from the book of Daniel and the book of Revelation, the lordship of history within certain parameters and for a fixed limited period of time will be given into the hands of Satan. While it's normally God who establishes and removes kings according to Daniel, for three and a half years, Satan will be in charge through the person of the Antichrist counterfeiting Christ and initially, before he shows his true colors, counterfeiting the millennial reign of Christ, persuading people things are actually going to get better before things actually do get worse. He comes like a lamb, but he speaks like a lion. So it really is. He will change the laws and he will change the times. Calendars are of theological significance in studying end time prophecy. The Hebrews, to make matters even more complicated, for the year of Jubilee, Hashanah HaYovel had another solar 
lunar calendar. Not just a lunar, not just a solar, but a solar calendar that was coordinated with the lunar calendar to determine the year of Jubilee, Hashanah HaYovel. Sometimes the month is rounded off in scripture in the book of Ezekiel to a 30-day period. Now again, why do we look at these things? Because of the 1,260 days, the 1,290 days, and the 1,345 days in the prophecies of Daniel and into the book of Revelation. Yes, it is confusing. Nonetheless, it's something that has to be factored into the equation of studying prophecy. The Middle East is a complicated place culturally. It's complicated, obviously, theologically by the multiple religions and the variations of the religions, not just Islam, but is it Sunni or Shia or Alawite, not just Judaism, but is it reformed, is it conservative, is it orthodox or is it Hasidic, not just Christianity, but is it Eastern Christianity or Western Christianity, not just Protestantism, but is it mainstream Protestantism, which is largely liberal, or is it something of an evangelical flavor? What a mess. And the Middle East has all of it and then some. On top of which, all matter of occult superstitions, from Kabbalah to New Age to mystical Islam, the Sufis. How do we make sense of any of this? Well, the only way to make sense of any of it is obviously to be led by the Holy Spirit and studying the Word of God and looking at these confusing constellation of events, religions, holidays, cultures, in light of what the Word of God tells us is going to happen. And so, heading into 2019, we begin with this week in prophecy. Immediately after New Year, John Bolton flew from Washington as National Security Advisor to Israel. The talk in the Middle East and in Europe has been the consequences of President Trump's plans to withdraw American troops from Syria. The fear expressed by multiple people was that he would be repeating the mistakes of Barack Obama. Barack Obama, of course, snatched defeat from the jaws of victory. When the surge of General Petraeus worked in Iraq, and Iraq was under control, he removed the residual American forces, creating a vacuum that ISIS filled. At the same time, the Obama administration, John Kerry, and Mr. Brennan of the CIA began their policy of attempting with the Arab Spring to overthrow the Assad regime in Syria. The way they did it, however, was shocking. They began arming militant Sunni groups who were against the Alawites, the Alawites being a Shia sect aligned with Iran, thus the Assad regime backed by Iran. The United States, the CIA, the Obama administration, actively, actively arming radical Muslims. Now, this was done with the Mujahideen following the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan. And it backfired on the West in the longer term. But the Obama administration deliberately, deliberately funded these radicals. Instead of overthrowing the Assad regime, which was increasingly backed by Iran and more so by Russia, they formed a union with ISIS, also created through the policies of the Obama administration in northern Iraq. So Obama funds these anti-Assad militias in Syria who are Sunni against the Alawites who are Shia. At the same time, he creates a vacuum in Iraq 
whatever mess the Bush administration made getting the United States into a situation that best described as an imbroglio in Iraq, going in and deposing Saddam Hussein without having a plan to get out, General Petraeus did have a plan and the surge worked until Barack Obama overturned the success, making it a failure, creating this vacuum. ISIS fills it, and then ISIS forms an alliance with the anti-Assad militia armed by the CIA during the Obama administration, creating the caliphate. This whole mess was largely the product of the failed foreign policies of Barack Obama and his henchmen, John Kerry, Hillary Clinton certainly, and John Brennan of the CIA being the chief culprits. The press doesn't report this except marginally. They all know it, but they don't tell you how this came about. Arrive Donald Trump. Donald Trump gets rid of the caliphate in both Iraq and in eastern Syria. He did what he said he would do. It is nearly destroyed. It is active in other areas of the world, but not in its epicenter. That was taken care of immediately after President Trump came into the Oval Office. He did what he said he would do. He got rid of nearly all of ISIS, except for residual pockets. It's gone. The caliphate is destroyed. As this caliphate emerged, Barack Obama mocked it as a JV team, as a junior varsity sports team. Well, two weeks later, the junior varsity sports team of Barack Obama, that he was instrumental in creating both in Iraq and in Syria, began committing unspeakably massive terrorist attacks far afield as Paris, Brussels, and San Bernardino, California. Thank you, Barack Obama. The blood is on your hands. You are incompetent and corrupt. You also drew a line in the sand, warning Syria and the Assad regime not to use chemical weapons. The United States would react, but you didn't when he used the chemical weapons. Putin knew you were weak. Assad knew you were weak. And they made their play because of your weakness. President Trump did react, but the media is against him. Now, again, I'm not making political statements in favor of Mr. Trump, and I'm not on a political campaign against Barack Obama. I'm simply stating what happened and how the situation came about. It was the product of the Obama administration's policies. That's why the caliphate emerged. The United States came and Syria fragmented. Russia, Iran, having effective control of areas in league with Assad, Turkey controlling other areas, and these independent militias controlling further areas still. The United States in league with the Syrian Kurdish population controlled the east and northeast on the east side of the Euphrates, necessary to eliminate ISIS and destroy the caliphate. When that is over, Mr. Trump announced he's removing the American troops from Syria. This creates a scare in Washington voiced by various people, including Special Envoy McGurk, who resigns He was in charge of American policy in northern Iraq and Syria in the war against ISIS and the caliphate. General Mattis, Secretary of Defense, then resigns also. Senator Lindsey Graham begins sounding a public alarm. Again, the fear was Donald Trump was going to do what Barack Obama did create a vacuum that would be filled by villains. 
It looked as if America destroyed ISIS, which Iran also opposes, and then says to Iran and to Russia, okay, we got rid of ISIS for you, here's Syria. That's what it looked like. It has since led to the resignation of the Pentagon's chief of staff, Kevin Sweeney. However, there is more than meets the eye. Senator Graham came to the White House for emergency meetings with President Trump, and President Trump explained his agenda and his plan, of which Senator Graham did not publicly comment on the specifics of what it was. But now we are beginning to see the thinking of the Trump administration. It is as follows. Mr. Trump has now announced that the American withdrawal from Syria will be progressive. It will not be suddenly. We are pulling back in Syria. We're going to be removing our troops. I never said we're doing it that quickly, but we're decimating ISIS. Europe and European members of NATO, as always, apart from the British, are looking for a free ride. They know Iran was a threat to European security, that Iran was funding and sponsoring terrorism, yet complained of the Trump boycotts and sanctions against Iran because they wanted German and French industries to continue doing business with Iran, which has now become very difficult and almost financially impossible. You take care of Iran and then you protect us. We want to trade with them. That was the policy of Germany and France. Mr. Trump had had enough. Many years ago, he determined Europe was getting a free ride, Japan was getting a free ride, South Korea was getting a free ride. I recall the first political statement he ever made a number of years ago during the Reagan administration when he complained about the Middle East policies of Reagan, saying, we are reflagging Kuwaiti ships. Why should the United States protect Kuwaiti ships so Kuwait can sell oil to Japan? And the American taxpayer picks up the bill for it. He was absolutely correct. These oil-rich countries should pay for American protection, even when it's in mutual interest. This is his mindset, and it's his mindset now. Remember, the United States spent more to defend Europe during the Cold War than Europe did. The American taxpayer put up more of the money for the cost of defending Europe than even affluent countries in Europe. When the Soviets deployed missiles pointed at England and Western Europe, Mrs. Thatcher and the American government responded by the deployment of cruise missiles and Jericho missiles. The European left objected so Russia would be able to target and intimidate, or the Soviet Union would be able to target and intimidate Britain and Europe, but there would be no effective response. Mrs. Thatcher and the American government, even under Carter, insisted, and a response was deployed. An arms race happened with the Soviet Union that plunged the United States into major debt under the Reagan administration, but effectively bankrupted the Soviet economy and was instrumental in bringing it down, resulting in the collapse of the Iron Curtain. This has always been the thinking of President Trump. Why should the American taxpayer pay for the privilege of defending affluent countries, oil-rich countries, industrialized European countries, while they, in turn, are trading with our enemies? They want the Russian pipeline but they want the United States to protect them while they're doing business 
with Russia, not thinking of the strategic liability of reliance on Russian natural gas. This was always their thinking. No, America, you protect us and just let us do business with the people you're protecting us from. This went on for years. It went on under Reagan. It went on under Carter. It went on under Ford. But it stops with Donald Trump. He draws a line. Part of Mr. Trump's complaint has been the Kurds were selling oil to Iran. He responded by saying, you want American protection, you cannot continue selling oil to Iran with impunity. Hence, part of the reason for his withdrawal from Syria was to force the Kurds, who are admittedly the only people in the Middle East and Mesopotamia the West can trust, to behave like an ally and not behave the way Western Europe has behaved, trading with the people you expect us to protect you from at our expense. He was dealing with the Kurds. The fear, of course, was, okay, we've gotten rid of the caliphate and of ISIS. Here you go, Iran and Russia, take it over. That was the obvious fear. We now learn, however, that was never the plan. The plan was to force regional allies in the Middle East, the oil-rich Arab countries, to cooperate with Israel in a joint defense effort in the face of Iran. He was trying to force the Arabs to collaborate with Israel to protect themselves against the Iranian threat. Brilliant? Some would say so. But it's the reality now. The Emirates, the Saudis, they're having to come to terms with the fact that they're going to have to assume more responsibility for their own defense. And the only way they can really do that without American boots on the ground is to befriend Israel. He was helping set the stage for his peace plan. It goes beyond this now. When Mr. Bolton arrives, he has um, talks, obviously, with the Israeli government and defense commanders. <coughs> At the same time, Benjamin Netanyahu had meetings with Mr. Putin, trying to have a coordinated strategy to safeguard Israeli concerns concerning the place of Iran being backed by Russia or in cooperation with Russia inside of Syria. An Israeli diplomatic initiative took place, an Israeli defense initiative has taken place with missile deployments and increased readiness for a confrontation with the Iranian-backed forces of Nasrallah in Lebanon. But essentially now, Jordan and more so Saudi Arabia and the Emirates and the Iraqis, that is the Sunnis in Iraq, need to realize that the United States is not going to continue doing what it did on the same terms. You're going to have to make peace with Israel and cooperate with the Israelis. Now, this would have ramifications not only strategically, but economically. Giving Israeli high-tech companies and agricultural exports access to those markets could be a natural result. Already, Saudi Arabia is talking about allowing commercial aircraft en route to and from Israel to fly over Saudi airspace. Things are beginning to change. And Mr. Trump 
has been the engine of that change. Now, U.S. Ambassador to Israel David Freed has announced that the unveiling of the Trump peace plan for the Middle East is delayed until after the Israeli elections. Reasonable. But the peace plan has in actual terms already begun to be implemented by forcing the Arabs to make a rapprochement with Israel in the face of the Iranian threat and the potential Russian threat. Mr. Bolton also flew to Ankara to Turkey, warning the Turkish government not to invade the Kurdish areas of Syria. The United States gave tons of military equipment to Kurdistan as soon as it announced the American withdrawal. They will have some capacity to defend themselves from any incursion from Turkey, howbeit for a limited amount of time. They've not been completely abandoned, but they are being pressured to stop befriending Iran and to realize that the Turkish threat is a threat that is a real one, but they cannot rely on the United States to protect them from unless they stand with the United States against Iran and, of course, with Israel. This plan of the Trump administration to withdraw American troops and force European allies, but more so indigenous Arab Sunni countries to make a rapprochement with Israel and to stand in a united front against the Iranian threat can be looked at in terms of a potential Gog and Magog scenario. Again, if there are two battles of Gog and Magog, not only the one set to occur at the end of the millennium, prophesied in the book of Revelation. What am I saying? As we pointed out repeatedly, no Arab countries are in the alliance of nations coming against Israel, except for Put, which is the ancient name for what is today called Libya. There's no Arabs. Why? Why? Could it be because they have been neutralized? That they have a defense interest in making peace with Israel? Now remember, Camp David was the beginning of this. There has been an effective peace, not always a politically happy relationship, but certainly a strategically stable one between Israel and Egypt. Then between Israel and Jordan. Under the present circumstances of the Iranian threat, the Gulf states and Saudi Arabia are being pushed by the Americans in the same direction as the Americans brokered Camp David, making peace between Israel and Egypt in the days of Anwar Sadat and Menachem Begin. And as the United States played a pivotal role diplomatically in brokering a peace between Jordan under the late King Hussein and the Israeli government, so too the United States is now attempting to play that kind of a broker role in dealing with the problem of anti-Zionist rejectionism by the more radical Sunni Muslims, the Salafists of Saudi Arabia particularly. Specifically, the Salafists of Saudi Arabia, run by the Wahhabist clergy, that as a theological point, must assume the political position of anti-Zionism as it presently stands. That has been a problem. 
while Jordan and Egypt were more secular in their government. Saudi Arabia and some of the Emirates are certainly not. Hence, the American pressure. And that pressure is happening by forcing them to look to Israel as a defense partner in the face of the Iranian threat. It is on this basis the United States is pushing to broker a friendship, even strategic cooperation between Israel and the Arab neighbors to the east beyond Jordan and in the Arabian Peninsula. Again, this would be political brilliance if Mr. Trump was able to do it. Now, we are, of course, aware the Antichrist will bring a false peace to the Middle East. We're not suggesting that Mr. Trump is the Antichrist or anything of that nature. We are simply saying there will be a false peace in the Middle East, engineered by the man of lawlessness. We simply mention that in passing. But it's important to understand from the perspective of prophecy the significance of what is happening this week in prophecy with the Bolton visits to Turkey and to Israel and the new announcements by the Trump administration that the withdrawal will not be as radical as anticipated from Syria, but will be more progressive. Again, there's also been an arming of the Kurds. Now, a warning to the Turks this week in prophecy. This week in prophecy. Again, Israel has reacted both diplomatically and strategically with the meetings between Mr. Putin and once again with Mr. Netanyahu. This is at least the eighth major summit they have had concerning Syria. This cooperation, or at least dialogue, between Israel and Russia is something to take note of. Russia is about the only serious power who has any influence on Iran because of its backing of Iran in Syria and Iranian reliance upon Russian technology and weapons. Nonetheless, it's happening once again this week in prophecy. This week in prophecy, 11 persons are going to be put on trial for the Khashoggi assassination. The death sentence has been asked concerning the assassination for five of the defendants. This is a confused state of affairs. As we've said, Khashoggi never should have been given a visa to come to the United States. He was not an American or a friend of America. He was Muslim Brotherhood. He was a bad person, a bad man. While I do not celebrate his death, neither do I personally mourn it. Whether or not Prince Mohammed bin Salman was in some way involved in the assassination of Khashoggi or not, I do not know. But I know that Khashoggi was a threat to the moderates in Saudi Arabia, and he was a threat to the interests of the United States. The left-wing Washington Post, of course, thought differently. These trials are going to be interesting. Are they going to be an actual trial or a show trial? If the Saudi government, the House of Saud, was actually in back of the assassinations, What will the ramifications of this be politically if it is divulged that they were and if some of these people are capitally executed, which is usually beheading in Saudi Arabia? The Khashoggi trials are going to be interesting because it's not about Khashoggi or the trials. It's about the status and political position of Prince Mohammed bin Salman, of whom we've spoken so much as a moderating force in Saudi Arabia and who will be a important figure in any peace with Israel and in any containment of the Salafist clergy. This week in prophecy, the Democratic Party in the United States has again assumed majority of the House of Representatives. There was no predicted blue wave as the media had promised. The Democratic Party did not make massive gains. They lost seats in the Senate. They continued to lose seats 
in the state legislatures and the state senates and in the governorships. But they did regain control of the House, but not by a landslide and not by a blue wave, more of a ripple. Now, this is typical and common that following a presidential election, the next election, the midterms, go for the party not in power. They go to the opposition. It is politically normal in the normal trend of American political history. This time, however, something happens. The Democratic Party is not united. There are left-wing factions who dislike Nancy Pelosi. She's being forced to pander to the extreme left and to the traditional Democratic Party base, which is effectively gone in terms of leadership, but still existing in terms of votership. As we pointed out, the Democratic Party that was centrist or right center of people like JFK or of Senator Scoop Jackson, Henry Jackson, or of Senator Sam Nunn. It ended with Senator Joseph Lieberman from Connecticut. He was the last centrist Democrat. Now it is a party of the left. It's a party of the left and the extreme left led by people like newcomers, Ocasio-Cortez, a woman who seems to have as her one ambition to be an American Che Guevara and to turn the United States into a Venezuela. The policies she's advocated are exactly the kinds of things that made Venezuela the mess it is today. But again, it's left-wing rhetoric, it's a lack of logic, it's emotion, it's gender identity politics, And Nancy Pelosi is having to try to juggle with this left-wing faction in the House, supported by the Bernie Sanders left-wing contingent within the Democratic Party generally, as opposed to trying to keep the traditional Democratic voting base more centered. Now, this is a problem. Because so much of the blue-collar traditional Democrat vote, particularly in the Midwest, states like Indiana and Ohio and as far east as Pennsylvania, certainly Wisconsin, they are the people who put Donald Trump in power. The Democratic Party is desperately trying to get back these centrists from these blue-collar jobs and blue-collar states and what's known as the Rust Belt. At the same time, simultaneously, having to pander to the extreme left wing, represented by Ocasio-Cortez, Alejandro Ocasio-Cortez, Maxine Waters, and others. You have a divided Democratic Party. The only thing that will unite them is a common hatred of the Trump administration. They will having lost the election democratically, attempt legal means to disrupt the Trump administration, knowing very well that an impeachment will result in nothing. He will never be removed from office by the Senate. Nonetheless, they will do it simply to disrupt in an attempt to discredit and an attempt to do anything they can to regain power. You're dealing with unprincipled people. At the same time, you have the Democrats in the Republican Party. Mitt Romney has arrived. Mitt Romney was a man from Bain Capital who was accused of looting industries in the manufacturing base, putting blue-collar workers out of jobs, letting those companies fail and moving on and doing it again, buying shares in struggling industries. That's how he made his money. Well, he's a carpetbagger. He relocated from Massachusetts where he'd been governor, then a failed presidential candidate, to Utah. As a presidential candidate, he was a disaster. First of all, his Mormonism alienated the evangelical base of the Republican Party. Mormons believe that Jesus Christ is the spirit brother of Satan. Secondly, 
the issue at the time he ran was Obamacare. But Romney invent, invented a version of Obamacare and implemented it in the state of Massachusetts before there was Obamacare. It was in Massachusetts because of Romney. Mr. Romney is the quintessential rhino, the quintessential Democrat and the Republican Party having taken the place of the late John McCain, who occupied that position previously. He's a never Trumper. He's an ideological Democrat. He's an enemy of the American manufacturing sector of the economy. He is, again, part of this Bain Capital who people have accused of pilfering American manufacturing based industries to make short term profits. Now he's attacking President Trump. It may be that Romney will move to challenge Mr. Trump for the nomination in the next presidential election. It is all political posturing. Once more, we ask people to pray for those who are in power. I'm not campaigning politically one way or another. I'm simply saying that Mr. Romney is a carpetbagger. He went to Utah to get the Mormon vote because he knew he could win because he was a Mormon. He believes that Jesus Christ is the spirit brother of Satan. Much as Harry Reid, former senator and House Majority Leader from Nevada, a Mormon holding those beliefs. Harry Reid did tremendous harm to the United States, tremendous harm. And Mitt Romney will do the same. He is, again, a Democrat sitting on the wrong side of the aisle. He's John McCain reincarnated in the Senate. Watch him. There is a traitor in the camp. And he's not the only one, but he's the most dangerous. Again, if I believed he had the best interest of the United States at heart, I would say nothing but he's a creature of the swamp, an establishment Republican. Same as the House of Bush and the Bush dynasty. He wants to restore the status quo that Mr. Trump disrupted. Had Romney been elected president, we can be sure the American embassy never would have been relocated to Jerusalem. We can be sure that the kinds of successes being made and the manufacturing sector never would have happened. He made his money by attacking the manufacturing se sector. But let's continue. Expect the Democratic Party united against itself, driven to try to attack President Trump by impeachment or any other means it can, simply because that is their only basis of unity. They are ideologically at odds with each other. Nancy Pelosi is getting older. She's not a very politically intelligent woman. Obamacare would have effectively nationalized 18% of the American economy, one-sixth of it. A 1,300-page bill with its addendums. And she said, we have to pass it to find out what's in it. That's what that woman actually said. If someone said that, you'd consider them to be a moron. But she is now Speaker of the House once again. We're looking at Iran this week in prophecy, and there are major developments. The IMF and the World Bank have revised predictions about the Iranian economy, moving it into the red, into negative territory. It is possible that in 2019, Iran could see a drop in its gross national product of 5.5%. That's very serious. A 5.5% drop in GNP is extremely serious. Even if it is half that, it would be problematic. But if it reaches 5.5%, it borders on economic disaster. Oil production has gone down as a result of the Trump embargo from 
2.5 million barrels a day to 1.1 million barrels a day. Iran is now selling 1.4 million barrels a day less oil than it did before Mr. Trump's sanctions. The inflation in Iran has been outrageous. This week in Prophecy, the Iranian Central Bank has announced its desire to remove four zeros, four, from the Iranian rial, their currency. There is now 110,000 rials to one US dollar, 110,000. So what do you do? Well, you get rid of the zeros. You make it worth a dime instead of worth nothing. It will not increase the real value of the real. Such effects are purely cosmetic. It's not going to help the economy benefit. It'll simply create an illusion that things are not as bad as they were. But four zeros is a thousand. Can you imagine? Can you imagine that if a $10 bill was worth a penny? <laughs> This does not look to be a very good year for Iran. But now let's take this even further. The increased fracking in the United States, the ANWR potential, and the possible pipeline construction are already drastically changing the nature of international oil, as we've said for some time. OPEC can never have the power it once had. The United States has now overtaken Russia and Saudi Arabia as the world's number one oil producer. America is also the world's number one natural gas producer, and it has the largest coal reserves in the world on top of it. What does this mean? Although other countries have moved for so-called renewable energies, that conversion is not cheap. Neither is the renewables energy base always reliable. There's not always a strong enough breeze to drive the windmills or a strong enough current to drive the turbines. There's not always enough sunshine to heat the water. They have to maintain two systems, the traditional fossil fuel system or uranium fuel system using nuclear technology with Iranian fuel reactors, or they have to use fossil, fossil fuels. This has driven up energy costs in Europe immensely. On top of that, the high level of tax is incredible. Already in Norway, in order to encourage people towards renewable energy, the level of taxation has been adjusted by the Norwegian government to the point that the government is now losing significant revenue for its other operations. Russia has the same problem. Oil prices are now again under $50 a barrel. Even if they increase, they are not going to increase to the levels they once were. Despite the problems of the Middle East, despite the um, de facto embargo, or at least sanctions on Iran and Iranian oil, and the inability of Iran to process its transactions in dollars, despite the almost defunct oil production of the world's biggest reserve holding oil country, Venezuela, despite that, the prices remain below $50 a barrel, and the factor in this is fracking. As long as the fracking continues, this guarantees the survival of the petrodollar. What Iran and China have wanted to do desperately is to replace the US dollar as the basis of world currency reserves. This puts the United States in a fantastically advantageous position. It is almost like 
you can write a check and never have to cash it. International commodities are transacted in US dollars, almost inevitably. They want to replace it with alternative currencies or a basket of currencies involving the euro and the yuan. That is the Chinese RMB. It has been the petrodollar that has prevented another currency from displacing the dollar as the basis for world reserves. This has resulted in one American administration after another, the Clintons, the Bushes most notably, in pandering and pandering and pandering to the Saudi Arabians and to the Emirates, even as they were funding radical Islam. This game is now over. This is one of the factors why we see Mohammed bin Salman in Saudi Arabia. But it is strengthening the dollar against other currencies. And by assuring the survival of the petrodollar, it will assure the survival of the US dollar for the foreseeable future as the basis of world currency reserves. This is a big game. What makes the United States a superpower is a combination of things. One of which, one of the fundamental pillars of American economic dominance since the end of the Second World War, and even prior, but particularly since Brenton Woods, has been world currency reserves. When the US dollar effectively replaced gold as the basis of value for other currencies. The petrodollar has perpetuated this and prevented other currencies from replacing it, or even a basket of other currencies from replacing it. But fracking has strengthened the petrodollar, only it is not Saudi or Venezuelan petroleum. It is now American petroleum. This has worked very well. Despite the efforts of the Obama administration to stop it, it is now progressing under the Trump administration in a favorable direction. Again, that is not a political statement, it is an economic statement. In France, this week in prophecy, we continue to see social and political instability in reaction to the economic policies that have hurt workers, driven up prices, limited wages, and increased taxation on the French middle class and working class. We see the yellow vest movement has not subsided or lost any momentum. 25,000 demonstrated this week on the Boulevard de Saint-Germain, one of my old hangouts in Paris. And, um, Similar such demonstrations have taken place in cities such as Bordeaux and Toulouse. Mr. Macron's popularity is at a drastic low. It will be interesting to see what takes place in Paris. I am convinced that his pandering to Islam against the interests of Israel has been a factor. Some people say he's been a friend of the Jew and the Jewish community. On the whole, he's pandered too much to the enemies of the Jewish community and the enemies of France. That, however, is not what the riots are about. When we had the Islamic riots and the banlieue around Paris, Paris is interesting. In the United States, the inner cities are where the slums are. The suburbs are where the affluent are. Paris is the opposite. Central Paris is the affluent area. The suburban belt around it, the banlieue, is where the slums are and where you have the high Islamic population. If the radical Islamic population goes on the war path again, as they've already done twice in Paris, at the same time where you have the working class and middle, lower middle class, particularly French population, in the yellow vest protests happening at the same time. 
you'll see a challenge to what is called the Fifth Republic. It'll be something akin to what transpired in France in 1968. But let's push ahead. This week in prophecy, there has been further uproars by the Palestinian Muslim population in Jordan. Remember, Jordan is 70% Palestinian, 30% Hashemite Bedouin, and they too are not always friends. In Black September, they fought each other. In protest against Israel at the entrances to the union offices of, of the National Labor Unions, Israeli flags were used as carpets by the Palestinian Jordanians walking over the Israeli flags to get to work. You couldn't enter the building unless you walked on them. This again was undertaken by labor unions with seven out of 10 people Palestinian. We can see a potential scenario in Jordan. In black September, the British trained Jordanian Legion massacred between 15 and 18,000 Palestinian Muslims in 12 days in Jordan. Yasser Arafat's attempted takeover. He called Jordan Palestine, which demographically it is. Nonetheless, the question is, can something like that happen again? Can King Abdullah II of Jordan continue to placate the Palestinian contingent of his population who are the demographic majority? If they came to power and deposed him, bearing in mind his regime is strongly backed by the Americans and British, but if they did depose him, the question becomes, could this be the fulfillment of the prophecies of the destruction of Amman, the capital, the land of the Ammonites, that have never happened yet? Will Israel have to invade Jordan if Jordan is taken over by radical Palestinians? Again, we don't know, but it has always been a possibility. It nearly happened in black September in 1970. And the way Jordan has drifted, particularly in the face of economic hardship, we need to take into account we could have another such attempt again. And such an attempt could involve an Israeli incursion, possibly an Israeli attempt to back the Jordanian government against the Palestinians, but possibly an Israeli involvement to conquer the Palestinians in Jordan. We can't make any predictions, but we have to look at these events in light of prophecy. At some point, there must be a destruction of Amman. In any event, that has been this week in prophecy. Please continue to pray for the president, for the parliament in Britain, for the Congress, for the Senate, irrespective of political party, we're called to pray for those who are in power. If these people are not influenced by our prayers, they'll be influenced by things worse, by the demonic. Also, please continue to pray for Benjamin Netanyahu and the government in Israel. Prayer is vital. Pray for those in authority. This is a teaching of the Old Testament and of the New. I cannot think of anything more essential right now as we look at the unfolding of prophetic events than the importance of prayer, including, if not especially, prayer for those in government, that they will make right decisions in accordance with the principles of God's word. My name is James Jacob Prash. God bless and thank you for listening.